So with that said, let's begin reading here in the book of Romans chapter 10. I'll, I'll begin at verse 1, read verses 1 through 4, and uh, we'll get into our study. Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. Paul writes, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so Paul had closed chapter 9 by sharing how the Gentiles uh, could be made right before God. And uh, the way that's going to take place, and he pointed that out, is by faith in Jesus Christ. And this is a theme that he will later develop in this letter, but he's already been doing that uh, to some extent from the beginning. Remember in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, he had said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. In chapter 4, verse 11, he said, He, speaking of Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. That righteousness might be imputed to them also. And so he's already been developing how people are made right with God. He spoke also of the Gentile nations. And so he stated that the Gentiles have been open to Christ, but Israel has rejected him. And this is because they believed that they became righteous by obedience to the law. And so they they have missed the key to being right with God, which is faith in Messiah. Now, that has been described, and he described it as a stumbling stone. He spoke of Jesus in that way. In First Peter, Peter also said it. He said in verses 6, and, 6 through 8 in chapter 2, he said, Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. And so he's pointed out that the Jews have stumbled at Jesus Christ, who is that stumbling stone. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 1.23, he had said, We preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, to the Greeks, foolishness. So chapter 10 begins with Paul revealing his heart's desire and prayer for the nation of Israel. And he says it very clearly, his desire and prayer is that Israel would be saved. And so in practice, this is how this occurs. He reveals the desire in two ways. One, he, uh, he wants to let them know his desire for them to be saved is, is, is evidenced by the fact that he preaches to the Jews first, and then second, he makes reference to the fact that they are in his prayers constantly. Now, when you read your Bibles in the ministry of Jesus, uh, Jesus obviously uh, took the message to the Jewish nation first, and that's revealed in the Gospels. For example, in Luke 4, 16, it says he came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, stood up for to read. And so it was his practice. He would go and preach, obviously, and teach the Jews. In Matthew 15, 24, he answered and said, I wasn't sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But later on, Jesus, in his training and commissioning of the apostles, he had taught them to reach out first to the Jew. Remember when he said that you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you? You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. So it began there, Judea, Samaria, then unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so they were commissioned to reach out to the Jews first. Now, in Paul's ministry, he'd often go to the Jewish synagogues. A good example of this is when he was in a place called Pisidian Antioch. It's recorded in Acts 13, 44 through 46, where it reads, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, 
and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, he said, we, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, Paul's desire is that his Jewish brethren, according to the flesh, be saved. And he also prayed for them constantly. Again, that was for them to be saved. He preached with great fervor that Jesus was the way to God. He not only preached, but he also prayed with great fervency. He said, God, I want you, I pray that you would move their hearts. And so he's speaking concerning that in verse 1 here in chapter 10 when he says, My heart's desire, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I preach to them and I pray for them. I want them to be saved and that's my greatest desire, the desire of my heart. But he goes on to develop in verse 2 and says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. This is a zeal that the Apostle Paul himself could understand because he too, before he was saved, had a zeal. And he would have said it was a zeal for God. What he was really zealous for was for the traditions of his religion. When he was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he said in verses 12 and 13, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He too understood zeal without knowledge. So he could understand their zeal, but he also could understand their ignorance. They were going about ignoring God's way of righteousness through faith because their their foundation of belief for a righteous relationship with God and a righteousness that they could possess came by following the law of Moses. Jesus said it like this in John 5, 45 through 47. He said, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words. And so the Jews went about establishing their own righteousness by attempting to obtain it by obedience to the law, a law that they could not actually ever completely obey. They couldn't fulfill it. He says in verse 3, they being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. By rejecting the gospel, they're remaining ignorant of God's righteousness. What happened is they ignored Jesus and his cross, and they were caught in a trap of their own works. And he points this out in verse 4. He says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. When he says Christ is the end of the law, he's saying the law of Moses is pointing to him. The law is concluded in him. Moses' writings are pointing to him. The law is pointing to Jesus, the one who fulfills the law. And so why can't the Jews be righteous by following the law? Because the law pointed to Jesus Christ and is fulfilled in him. He said in Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So Jesus came to fulfill the demands of the law. And so he's speaking concerning that. Why cannot Israel be made righteous? Because they're rejecting the one who fulfilled the demands. Israel could not by their obedience do so because they were weak by flesh. Jesus did it because he had no sin and therefore was capable of keeping the law perfectly and that's why we are to look to him. The law was pointing to him. He says in verse 5, Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. So Moses' writing reveals the frustration that you have in trying to obey the entire law. 
Again, why? Well, the law reveals the inner motives as well as the lack of holiness. In Galatians 3.12, Paul said this. He said, the law is not of faith, but the man that does them shall live in them. He went on in chapter 3, verses 21 and 22 of Galatians to say, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And so this is called the righteousness of faith. Verse 6 says, the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Who's going to ascend to heaven? Who's going to descend into the abyss? What is he saying? He's saying self-efforts to become righteous are not possible. God has made it possible by faith in him. God has made it possible for us to have relationship and fellowship with him through Christ. We cannot ascend, nor can we descend. What we need to do is recognize that this has been done by Jesus Christ. Jesus incarnated. Jesus died. He was buried, but he was resurrected. And so he's pointing to the fact that you can't keep the law and be made, uh, made whole and righteous, but you can believe in the one who perfectly obeyed it and thus gives to his, us his own righteousness. And so he goes on and he says, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. The word is near you even in your mouth and your heart. In the gospel, this is revealed. How can I be saved? By Jesus Christ. Now I want to touch something that is kind of old, but some of you may have been familiar with it. Heard it, it's still used, this phrase is still used today, and I want to kind of touch on this for a moment. Again, look at verse 8. It speaks of the word of faith which we preach. Well, he uses the phrase, the word of faith. There was, there were, and still are, teachers who are on television, on the radio, in print, writing books and going different places, holding conferences and seminars, and they speak of what is called the word of faith, and they're called the word of faith ministry. Some of you are familiar with them. We have people in our fellowship who... Uh, who came out of the Word of Faith Ministries, which is basically if you confess it, you possess it. And they refer to that as the Word of Faith. Uh, many, many years ago now, I was given a series in, in, uh, on Sunday mornings, and, and I was mentioning this particular doctrine. I'm not going to belabor this point right now. But I was speaking concerning this doctrine and its error because it was... It was, a, it was a message that was bringing a lot of people into bondage. Their faith, they would say, was just not enough. They didn't have the ability to command God so that he would obey them because, in fact, they thought that their faith would make God do that which they desired. And so I pointed that out. And there was a particular well-known preacher at that time who was on television and all. And I had some of his material. I had printed out some of his quotes. And, and so as I was speaking... I, um, I quoted this particular fellow and, and pointed out why what he was saying was error. And then I did it later. Well, I did it the next week. Well, I was at the Bible college. I used to teach at the Bible college, the Calvary Chapel Bible College up in when it was in Twin Peaks. And I was uh, teaching a class up there. I, I did it on a couple of occasions. I took students to uh, classes. And this guy walks up to me. Uh, on the first day, and he says, I want to talk to you for a moment. And he said, of course. And he says, um, he says, you know, he goes, I want you to know that I went to your church. He said, and uh, he's, he lived in the area. He said, I usually went to this particular teacher's church. He goes, and you quoted him. And I'd been going to his church for some time. And you quoted him. And you said that he was teaching error. He said, it got me angry. He said, because I had all of his tapes. He said, and so, he goes, when you quoted him, you also gave the reference. You told me the tape number and the, and the title of the message. So he said, I went directly home, and I 
got that tape because he had all his tapes he's hid in his garage. And he said, and I play that message through. And he says, it, it kind of, it shook me up because you quoted him correctly and in context. And that bothered me. He said, so the next week I came back because I wanted to make sure, you know, that, uh, that I could prove you wrong. He said, and you did it again. He said, you quoted him a second time. See, I never do that, but this time I did. He said, you quoted him again. He, got, I, he said, I got angry, and I went home, and I found the tape, and I listened to it. He said, and, and you did it again. You were, it was right. He says, I just want you to know that I was part of that ministry for many years, but he says, now I'm a Bible study uh, student here. After that, I was at a Calvary Chapel pastor's conference, and he walks up to me at the conference, and he had become a Calvary Chapel pastor. He pastors a church in San Antonio, Texas. His name is Ron Arbaugh. And so I introduced him to the other pastors by saying, this guy was a heretic, but now he's okay. <laughs> you know? But see, that, that's the word of faith. The, the, the phrase was taken out of context, and that's the reason I told you that story. Because what it was doing, it was placing an emphasis on your personal faith. But that's not what he's speaking about. It's called the word of faith because it's referring to the gospel that when received by faith results in salvation. It's not a phrase that refers to faith-filled words. It's a phrase that speaks of the message of salvation. In Galatians 3 verse 2, Paul said, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And so this is a message of faith. This is the word of faith. And you receive it by faith. And that's the point he's making. And so he, in speaking of this word of faith that he's preaching, this is what he says, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The word confess is a word that tr is translated uh, to say the same words or to agree. Uh, homologeo, say the same words. It speaks of agreeing. It speaks of agreeing with what God has said about Jesus. If you are in confession with God, if you're in agreement with God that Jesus is Lord, if you are agreeing with God about the lordship of his son and by faith you have trusted him, you will be saved. Remember the apostle Thomas? We know him as Doubting Thomas. In John 20, verses 27 and 29 through 29, Jesus, uh, chapter 20, 27 through 29, Jesus was speaking to Thomas this is what he said to him. He said, reach your finger here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. How are you saved? Have you seen Jesus physically? No. We see him by the eye of faith. The word of God reveals him to us. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And because we're convicted, we confess in agreement with God. And we say, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. God's word says if you confess of your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so you confess, you're in agreement with God that Jesus is Lord. And by faith, you receive him. And that's the point that Paul is making here. That's how you get saved. You see, there are people have, who have gone up and answered an invitation or perhaps have repeated a prayer. But when you're truly confessing Christ, you actually consider him your Lord and you follow him completely. It's like what he said in Luke 9, 23. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily 
and follow me. And so confessing Christ as Lord is yielding yourself to him, recognizing who he is, by faith acknowledging him as your Savior, turning from your sin, and receiving the power of the Spirit who resides within you. So he goes on, and he says uh, in verse 10, with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For, excuse me, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is for everyone. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. There are those who think that there are only certain people who are going to be saved and that salvation is available to only certain people. But salvation is for everyone. God so loved the world that he gave his son. He loved the world so much that he gave his son. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, Paul tells us that God will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. That's why, that's why we preach the gospel, and that's why Paul would go to the synagogue. That's why Paul would preach the message to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. That's why he would take this blessed message to people and he would share with them the goodness of God and encourage them to believe and turn from their sin. That's what you see in the Bible when you, when you like even now, we're going through the book of Acts. On Sunday, I'll be sharing some of these things with you as we continue our journey through snapshots in the book of Acts. And, and just, just, uh, this, just today, I finished preparing the study concerning um, the work of the Spirit in in the mouths of and in the lives of the apostles. And Jesus had given them a message, and he had said to go, to go and preach this message to all creation, to all everywhere, go throughout the world and proclaim this message. And the message of the, of the gospel goes throughout the world. And a lot of preachers have had the opportunity of doing that, to actually to go on boats or to tra travel on horseback, to fly. And, and, and they've taken this message throughout the world. It's, it's not just for, it wasn't just intended for the Middle East. It was intended for the entire world. And, and, and it's a message we preach. And 2,000 years later, we continue to preach this, this particular message. Why? Because whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And it's our desire for people to have a relationship with God, for their sins to be forgiven and their miserable lives be changed so that they might have joy, so they might have love, so they might have peace so they might exercise faith, so they might have relationship with others, that their life would be blessed by God. That's why we preach the gospel, so that when they close their eyes here, they open them up there. That's why when one of our friends or our loved ones passes on and, and leaves, we grieve. We grieve in ways that sometimes the world doesn't understand. They think, where's your faith? Why do you cry so deeply? It's because we love deeply. And when you love deeply, you miss deeply. But we know that here on the face of the earth, we say goodbye, but it's temporary. We know that one day we'll see them again, you see. And that comes through the gospel. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus gave his life. That's why Paul went to the Jew first and also the Gentile. That's why he prayed for them. And that's why he preached to them. I really believe that the church needs to wake up in these last days and, and once again be ignited to do that. Guys, you know, I, I really feel, and I'll say this quickly, I really do believe that darkness is overcoming in some ways. I think that there is an evil that it's the mask of the devil is being removed and we're seeing it more clearly now. We're seeing it more clearly. But I'm, I'm, not, as, I, I, I'm not without hope because even, even if it seems that, that evil is going to conquer, Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against his kingdom. And so we continue to proclaim this message and we encourage people to live for Jesus Christ. Why? Because they'll be forgiven of their sins. They'll be cleansed of their unrighteousness. And when they close their eyes here, they behold him there. What a promise we have. And that's why Paul said, I want to preach the gospel. In Revelation twenty-two seventeen, 17, we read the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts let them come. 
And whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. It's offered to us. Take it if you come. Well, he goes on in verse 14. He says, how then shall they call on him in whom they haven't believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As, is, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful are the feet. My mom didn't like my feet because I preached without <laughs> shoes. But anyway, I better get back to the study. He says in verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? You see, if we are saved, we have the responsibility to proclaim this message of the gospel. Sometimes we rely on other people to do the work that we cannot at that time or yet do ourselves. That's understandable. When I first got saved, first got saved a week, two weeks, three, three weeks in Jesus, what do I know? I was blind, now I see. I was lost, now I'm found. That's as much as I knew. But what, what is it I and a lot of people did at that time? Some of you might have heard stories of this. Perhaps you were saved back at that time too. What did we do? We could only share so much, but we would say, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. What we would do, in other words, was invite people to church. We invited them to, uh, I invited them to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. I invited them to go and hear a young man named Lonnie Frisbee. And I didn't know how to present the gospel yet, but I knew I was supposed to. And that became my quest in life, is to learn to communicate the truth of God's word. You see, I knew from the beginning, and this is the heart, by the way, of the Jesus movement or revolution, we were to reach out to the lost. And it wasn't just some special preacher. We were to learn to communicate the gospel ourselves. There are those who say, but, but I don't have the gift of evangelism. I'm not a missionary. Well, we may not all be evangelists or missionaries, but we are all witnesses. And that's what Jesus said. You shall be witnesses to me. So we can speak of that which we've seen and experienced. And so we're to go out. We're to preach. How, they, how shall they call on him in whom they haven't believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they haven't heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? That makes us the preachers. He goes on in verse 15. How shall they preach unless they're sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. It requires God to send forth his preachers. Notice verse 15. How shall they preach unless they're sent? God sends forth his preachers. And preachers are those who proclaim the message. The proclamation of the message is done by the one commissioned by God. Remember in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 1, verse 7, it reads, The Lord said to me, Do not say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you and say whatever I command you. And so Jeremiah said, Oh, Lord, I am but a youth. I, I'm too young. I have no experience. How can I do that? So God rebukes him and says, No, don't be saying you're too young. You go to the ones I send you. Here's something for you to do. You might want to learn to do this. You might want to ask the Lord when you're getting up in the morning, who do you want me to share with today? Who would you like me to share with today? Now, I'm not saying you'll do it every day. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But be prepared. You will be surprised how many opportunities open up to you. You'll be surprised. Somebody will be talking to you. What did you do this Sunday? Well... I went to church. Why'd you go to church? What's wrong with you? Well, that's why I went to church. <laughs> There's something wrong with me, right? So you have opportunities. I can't share with you many opportunities that I've had just by being available. I encourage you to be also. You see, Paul had a commission that he had received from the Lord. In Ephesians 3.8, he said to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. 
And so how beautiful, verse 15, are the feet. Now, when it says how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, when he uses the word feet, there's a couple of ways you can look at this one. It can be speaking of the way someone lives, also called a person's walk. Colossians 1.10 says uh, that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. So it speaks of your walk, living a life worthy of the Lord. Or, or in 1 John 2.6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And speaking of a way of life, and so how beautiful are the feet could speak of your way of life. But it also can be speaking of simply the fact that you're sent to proclaim this message. Now, it says in verse 16, they haven't all obeyed the gospel. They haven't believed. He's speaking of Israel. National Israel rejected Messiah, the Messiah who was portrayed to them so clearly in the book of Isaiah and various other Old Testament books. But he goes on in verse 17. And because we're going to have communion, I'm going to close here and pick up next week. I've been kind of hurrying to do this so we can have communion together. He says this, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I, um, and I'll close, I'll take a couple moments to share this. I'll be, I've been... Um, I'm going to be preaching at the pastor's conference that's coming up in November. I teach at the pa pastor's conferences, and I'll be teaching this year. I've chosen to speak on the Apostle Peter. Every one of the pastors who's going to be teaching has been requested to, to, uh, to, to give a special snap, uh, snapshot of, of a Bible character. I chose to speak about the Apostle Peter. I especially wanted to speak about the Apostle Peter in the portion of the Gospel of John where he was restored to ministry. I won't go into all of that right now. I'm keeping an eye on, on our time. Jesus, when he restored him, asked him a question. He said, do you love me? We all know the story. Do you love me? Do you have agape for me? And Peter says, you know that I have phileo, friendship, love for you. Peter, do you love me more than these? You know that I have friendship, love for you. And finally, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me? But he used the word phileo. I'm going to receive you where you're at, and I'll take you where I am. I'm going to be sharing with the pastors this. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep and take care of my lambs. What am I going to exhort Pastors, too, what you guys receive every time you come here, to avoid the temptation of wanting to become the popular preacher, teaching on subjects and things that don't edify to the obedience of Christ. To make sure we teach the word of God line upon line, chapter by chapter, book by book so that we as pastors can actually tend or tenderly care for the young ones in the church, young in faith as well as in age, and the seasoned saints who still need to be directed in the proper direction so that they might have a more fruitful to the end of their life experience with God. What is the thing that I as a pastor am very concerned about? Is that because there seems to be amongst younger people at least an appearance of a lack of interest in the things of the Spirit, the pastors are attempting to entertain them into the kingdom of God by getting special music or special speakers or special subjects, trying to find that place. But I discovered a long time ago that if you teach through the whole counsel of God, the various subjects that the culture may be going through, is going to be, are, will, they will be addressed. And you can bring the word there and bring it to that situation. But if every week I give to you the talk of, topic of my interest, you're going to be formed into my image and not into the image of Christ. You're going to start sharing. Many of you would just leave. Others will stay. Those who stay are going to be shaped into my image, my interests, my subjects. 
And as a result of that, they're not going to know the whole counsel. And so if you teach through the whole word of God, you have the opportunity of speaking of a variety of things that the culture is going through. You just have to be as clear as you can concerning those things so that people have the opportunity of knowing these things are going on, but here's the solution to those things. Before I got saved, we, we had the same kinds of problems. We had ecological concerns. We had drug concerns. We had violence concerns. We had war concerns. We had diseases. You name it. Same kinds of concerns that are today. So I thank God for those who were faithful to preach the solution and not just speak of the problem. The solution was change lives in Jesus Christ. How do you change a world? One person at a time. And when you touch that one person, that one person might touch two or three others with the gospel. And so on, and so on, and so on. And if you look at the early history of the Calvary movement, there were young men, 17, 18, 19, and 20, that God began to use. Men like Greg Laurie, who was 17 years old. Men like Rawl, who was in, he was in his early 20s. And, and others like them, myself included, at the age of 20. And God grabbed hold of our hearts. He changed them, and he gave us ministry. He gave us opportunity to proclaim this message, to see the transformation of not just a few, but for us 42 years of seeing God do transformations in lives. And it all comes through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what the church is to be faithful at doing. And that's why Paul's prayer and concern for his, for his brethren according to the flesh, that they might receive the Messiah they're trying to become righteous through the obedience to the law of Moses, but the grace of God is shown in the face of Jesus Christ. And when they get saved, they can have relationship with God and bring this transforming message to others. That's how it works. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why we need God's holy word, because the holy word and the Holy Spirit will produce holy lives, and holy lives can reach out to people and see transformation when you're faithful to the holy message. And so we're going to stop here. We'll pick up next week.